to the eternally curious, unapologetically superstitious Midnight Society rejects, Stormy Willow welcomes you. We are the eccentric coots, storytellers, explorers, dabblers, practitioners, and paranormal pupils who examine the what's ifs, the what's that's, and WTFs of this dimension and beyond. Welcome to the Stormy Willow Podcast, a lighthearted, balanced examination of the paranormal. I'm your host, Sarah Sellers. And I'm your host, Adele Collins. Hey, Dale and friends. Hey. How's it going? <laughs> it's going. It is going. It's uh, June's almost over already. Can you believe it? Yeah, it's been kind of a doozy of a weekend, I guess. It's been a really weird one. Uh, so we're recording at a different day um, in light of uh, our rights being taken away on Friday. <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> it's been really weird. Uh, listeners, I'm sure you guys are feeling all the things we are. I, I was telling my husband, I was venting today. I was like, you know, I'm going to be 40 tomorrow, which kind of comes with its own like you just feel kind of weird like how time flies I'm like I think the weirdest thing for me is that I went to sleep Thursday night and woke up Friday morning with zero control of my uterus and that's weird yeah and uh I know that this is just going to be a domino effect of gay marriage being overturned and all sorts of other horrible things maybe even interracial marriage and actually it leaves it up to the states to criminalize even sodomy it's it's horrible and uh, it's definitely I'm feeling all the things I'm feeling the anger and the sadness and it's just yesterday uh, you know we've been talking a lot about our events and we had our second annual pride event here in Rock Hill and it's like on Friday I, I haven't looking forward to this so much because like I didn't even want to do anything and, but I am so glad I went because when lighthearted people gather it was so nice to yeah. have the hugs and the support. And let me tell you, ask me how many protesters we had. How many? Zero. That's great. What my friend said, that's because they're all at home eating fried chicken, celebrating their victory. <laughs> yeah, that's probably true. <laughs> uh, and so but there was one guy that like basically just said, go Trump, which whatever. And there was somebody that kind of rubbed their engine at someone at a crosswalk. Um, and that was really it. So, you know, okay. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, don't, I don't know. We were, I think everybody, the loving, wonderful people I was with, I think no one was in the mood to deal with that yesterday. I think they were like, not today, please. Yeah, <laughs> not today. Yeah. That's so it my, my weekend week. has been kind of weird, just existential depression, <laughs> a lot it's of, so a lot of wine. <laughs> yeah. A lot of. I mean, I got forced to do bow time um, on Friday. And if you hear this podcast, you know what a fan of bow jangles Adele and I are. <laughs> and all I wanted on Friday was a cherry limeade from Sonic. You know, I don't know why. I just, I never craved that. I just wanted that. So I go there and the lady tells me they're too busy to come back later. And at that point, the tears just started. I was like, I have no rights reproductively and I can't even get a fucking cherry limeade. I was like, I hate it here. <laughs> And so yesterday at Pride, my friend Chastity it brought me and her daughter brought me a huge cherry limeade. <laughs> they nice. waited 30 minutes to make sure I had my cherry limeade. Oh, wow. And that was just the sweetest damn thing ever. <laughs> I guess Sonic is just booming in Rock Hill, South Carolina. I guess. Uh, or they're short staffed like everybody else. It's that who are doing the best they can. So, yeah, it's just not been a real great time. So. No. Yeah. I'm sorry this happened like right around your birthday. That's such a buzzkill. It is such a buzzkill, especially when you're somebody who, I don't know, someone who equality means so much to. I really did. It's been really hard to kind of want to celebrate or too much. You know, I have, I pushed through and I've felt all the love, but it's, you know, it's just kind of, I worry about. I worry about all of us and 
nationwide, every woman got kicked in the cooter on Friday. Yeah, they did. <laughs> they, did. they certainly did. And um, it wasn't fun. The Supreme Court's very dangerous, but you know what? We're not going to talk any more, I think, about this. Or no. We're just going to kill the episode, and that's not what we're about. <laughs> that's so. right. That is not what we're about. We're And if you're listening to this, um, then I'm sure you're a lighthearted friend, and we know that you're feeling it, and we just want you to know you're not alone. Yeah. We're all feeling it, and we're in it together, and we this figured out somehow. <laughs> somehow, yeah. some way. So, so speaking of uh, events, the Rock Hill Pride was a huge success. Last year, 30 vendors. This year, Adele, 100 vendors showed up. It was a great that's time. Huge. And it, by the way, yes. Rock Hill, South Carolina, it's only a population of like 75,000 people. So, I mean, that's pretty big. And I want you to know, I also met some witches there, uh, which I thought was really cool. They had uh, a table and they have not been welcomed at other venues and they were just so excited to be a part of our community's um, festivities and I just thought that was so cool because what a great event when all people are welcome and yeah. it's just um, it meant a lot to to them to be there and I thought it was really cool that they were there and like everybody was represented and I just thought that was something really awesome so despite everything there was it was a good day here in Rock Hill it was such a blast I think everybody needed each other and needed that community support. And I hope that wherever you are, you're finding that support in your pods, in your tribes. (laughs) It's much needed. But speaking of events, what's what's going on around? Yeah, so um, this is going to be right in my backyard, even though I hate the town once I visited. Um, The UFO Festival will be in Roswell, New Mexico this weekend. That sounds fun, though. So I might, I might check that out. Um, that like vendors just, and displays. Yeah, I don't know. And... Just an FYI, if like, hello, you know our podcast. So of course I wanted to visit Roswell before we moved to New Mexico. Um, so my wife and I did that um, on our honeymoon. We just did a day trip and whoa. <laughs> Like, yeah, um, Roswell's yeah, not my favorite place. Yeah. <laughs> it is not what you... Um, would imagine. I'll Would you say it it's the way. Myrtle Beach of the West? It might be worse than Myrtle Beach. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah. It. I. I wouldn't stay there overnight. That's all I'll say. If you're gonna do it, go for a day trip. It's not even gonna take you a day to get through the whole town. And there's just like a few little kitschy things with aliens, and that's it. And it was very disappointing <laughs> but maybe the ufo festival will be good we'll that see. sounds like a bummer roswell seems like just such a cool place and yeah it's not it yeah. really just felt like an extension of texas um, yeah because it's really close to the border like well, it felt you know what, though? like the south but, not the southwest but the festival might be really a cool time to go yeah the festival might bring weirdos out which will make it a little bit more fun so our kind of people we'll see we'll see i don't know i haven't decided yet because it is like four hours away so kind of a big angle uh, yeah and i don't want to stay there overnight so <laughs> and you know you're not gonna get up early so oh, and just, by the, <laughs> just a funny story so we stayed overnight and we wanted to get an airbnb and uh there were like three houses that were options and we had picked one and I was like, mm, I don't know if I want that one. How about the other one? And then it turns out all three are owned by the same people and they're all three in a row. And like these people have just like all these crazy highlighted passive aggressive instructions taped everywhere and all this religious crap. And I was like, you have to be kidding me. Like we stayed there on like our gay honeymoon, you know, and I was like, these people are going to freaking try to lynch us or, t- you know, testify or witness to us. Adele was sending us text messages like in case anything happens. Like, <laughs> we had, I, was, I was really scared for you. Yeah, it was scary. So, um, yeah, Roswell's not my favorite, but <laughs> hey, there's a UFO festival. Yeah, I'm there. Um, I think the UFO festival might redeem it. Okay. There's uh, there's a few other events too. So one is Fan Expo Denver in Denver, Ooh. Colorado. That is also next weekend, July 1st through the 3rd. So this one includes sci-fi, horror, anime, and gaming. So it sounds like fun crowd. 
Yeah, very fun. And just to uh, shout out to our neighbors in the north, I will be immigrating to Canada in the next few years, and I'm going to start throwing your events into this too, because they're soon going to be my events as well. So, uh, Kelowna, I don't know if I'm saying that right, um, fan experience in Kelowna, British Columbia, Canada, is uh, July 16th through the 18th, and that also seems kind of like a mixed bag of like sci-fi, horror, anime, and fun stuff like that. Nice, very nice. And last but not least, your birthday is on the 27th (laughs) tomorrow. And it's a big one, guys. It is a biggie. Big (laughs) 4-0. Lordy, lordy, Sarah's 40. Yeah. In the town we grew up in, in Fort Mill, South Carolina, uh, at the time it was a very, very small town. Everybody knew each other. And there was this main street, and you go down the main street, and there's a stop sign at the end, and there's a big brick thing, like wall, and everybody would always spray paint on like a sheet. Lordy, lordy, Sarah's 40. And I always remember mom saying, I swear to God, kids, when I turn 40, you better not ever do that to me. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, and then they also had like the nifty, nifty Sandy's 50. 50. They would do it all the time. And like, now it would probably be banned because it's like a bougie little place now. But, you know, back when it was just a a fun little town when we grew up there, (laughs) it was like, you got you know, a little birthday message I painted on the sheet for the whole town to see. <laughs> it, was, it was great. <laughs> and then yeah. you would go to the fish camp where you knew they were going to all come out clapping and singing to you. And it's just a little bit of time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, uh, in a good time, uh, I've got our forecast. For oh, us. God. Are you ready? Do I even want to know? <laughs> you know, I think you do want to know. And... I was kind of scared. Like, I'm going to be honest with you. I just did this like an hour before we recorded because I did not know. I was like, I don't know if I want to know what is in store for us. <laughs> so <laughs> I put it off to the last minute and I visited our, uh, vi- visited our friends at Cafe um, Astrological, which is such a fun website. So over my head. Uh, I know we say it all the time. Um, you folks that are out there, do you understand fully all of this you are so freaking smart and I give you all the all of my like applause and credit because it's really something so this forecast uh kicks off today June 26th through July the 2nd and Adele I think you're gonna find it very interesting based on the shit that's gone down and just some personal conversations that you and I have had I feel like this forecast really speaks to you so see if you, you feel the same way. So we have a new moon in Cancer on Tuesday. And this is a good time to commit to personal goals. Um, it's also a great time to honor, like for it, your raw emotions, <laughs> oh. <laughs> which I feel like we are doing, uh, all of us, a lot of us here in this country. And it says, allow time for us to accept and offer support to others. Wow. I'm like, wow. I, I've got goosebumps on, on that one. That's pretty it, uncanny. Very. It's also a great time to improve on your domestic side of life and um, goals that maybe you have put off for a very long time. And it's also, here you go, Adele, time to plan a big, long time adventure. Hey. Which I thought was kind of interesting. Yeah. I remember so, the Halifax. I think we so, decided on that city. <laughs> <laughs> so with cancer energy on our side, we have a chance to make important changes that will benefit us beyond this moon cycle. Which I think wow. This new moon is tightly squared with Jupiter. So things you want to be uh, aware of, be aware of doing too much, misjudgment or false starts. So I thought that was a pretty interesting uh, forecast in light of everything. I-, I know we've been talking about, you know, America and what it's become and what's coming in the future. And I just kind of thought that this forecast, the, the stars, the planets kind of put it together in a nice neat package. And it just made me think about um, just the uncertainty and that how universe somehow knows and nothing shakes the universe as we get shaken. And so there's always um, sometimes when bad things happen, it's a chance to, rebound into something new exciting and great 
So uh, that's what I wish for all of us. Uh, so yeah, so there it is. I thought it was very, very awesome. So I hope that you all find peace in that and hope that you find peace, uh, and maybe some adventures you put off and find domestic peace and, you know, creating harmony in the ways that you can. Cool. Sounds good. Yes. And so if you are new to our podcast or you never watch our podcast, uh, we started this thing a few weeks ago or we have this big wheel that we spin that tells us what topic we're going to cover. And so Adele got to spin the big wheel last week. And if my memory serves me correctly, I don't think it's gone yet. You have um, you have a possession, right? And that you're what you this this the theme that you that you spun. So yeah. I'm pretty excited. I don't know of a lot of people that have been possessed. So I can't wait <laughs> to hear what you landed on. <laughs> yeah, I have quite a doozy of a story. Um and actually an investigative reporter like uh really got down to the bottom of this in the late 90s. All right. Um So this is the possession of, we now know, Ronald Hunkler. Um, The pseudonym leading up like throughout the past, and don't worry, you're going to recognize this in a moment. So a lot of news articles published a lot of things on the subject. And the pseudonym you may know is Roland Doe or Robbie Mannheim. Today, we do know that it's actually Ronald Hunkler, and this is the possession that inspired the movie The Exorcist. Oh, whoa. That's some serious stuff. Yeah. Um, One thing that troubled me whenever I was researching this, though, was source to source. There were some inconsistencies in the story, being timeline, um order of events and even some of the priests who either were there or weren't there in some of the stories Hmm. so not only did that bother me in my research it bothered an investigative reporter who we're going to talk about later who did a really great job of breaking this down identifying who the actual person was and actually talked to the guy on the phone like oh Wow. Okay. Yeah. So he well, really listen. Uh, I just want to say before we get started, if you're watching, I'm drinking this delicious green chili wine that Adele and Amanda sent to me for my birthday from New Mexico, and I just want to say cheers. And I think it's so perfect before you get started because it looks like an extra cooler. So <laughs> I'm, I'm ready for this wild ride. So let's go. Let's yeah, this is it. wild. Here and, we go. Uh, yeah. And Noisy Water Winery, thank you for your green chili wine. It's delicious. (laughs) So So good. So good. Such a great gift. (laughs) Um, So I have quite a few sources because, as I mentioned, some of the details just really bothered me that they didn't match up. So it led me down a rabbit hole, really doing kind of my own investigative research. Oh, my gosh. This guy who already did it. Um, So my sources were strangemagazine.com, all things interesting skepticalinquirer.org inside edition uh, oh. <laughs> of course wikipedia the new york post and the mad truther.com as well as findagrave.com <laughs> so wow, okay. i there. <laughs> went all over the place with this so <laughs> like it. what i'm going to start out is there again Depending on what source you may have referenced, there's going to be some inconsistencies. But what I tried to do was to lay out generally what seemed to have happened. So some of the details might differ from source to source, but I tried to do my best of, all right, this is the general story of this possession. And then we're going to go into the details with the investigative reporter. Let's break it down. So in a suburb of Washington, D.C., Uh, called Cottage City, Maryland. Um, We know that that is the actual location. There are some other towns, I think, referenced in some some of the sources, but we do know, thanks to this investigative reporter, that it is Cottage City, Maryland, and the year is 1949. Oh, okay. So just a little bit about Ronald first. So um, apparently he grew up and had a completely normal life. Um, He actually was a retiree from NASA, so he was a NASA engineer after nearly 40 years. 
That's pretty impressive. And uh, he even patented a special technology to make space shuttle panels resistant to extreme heat. So oh, way to go, Ronald. Okay. Underachiever. Yeah. <laughs> right. <obviously. laughs> so, at, at this time in 1949, he is 13, I think in real life, some, some accounts say 14. So he's 13 or 14. <laughs> okay. So he's an early teen. He's an early teen. Um, and he was an only child and he really gravitated towards adults for friendship, especially his aunt Harriet. So aunt Harriet sounds like a blast. She was a spiritualist yes. and she taught him many things, including how to use the Ouija board. Go aunt Harriet. Yeah. And um, early 1949, maybe January is what it sounds like, might be around the, the time that the strange activity starts happening okay. at his home. Um, so Ronald starts hearing scratching in his room. Um, water drips from pipes, but there's no explanation to what's causing like the, the leaks. Uh, his mattress would even start moving really like violently when he was trying to sleep in it. Oh, I don't like that. Yeah. The family witnessed furniture moving and levitating, including like fruit and things like so that. So the family's actually seeing this stuff happening too. So it's not just in his right. head, if you will. Okay. Okay. Um, the strange part though is that uh, they also witnessed the strange noises, but they only witnessed them when Ronald's nearby. So it's his presence that's kind of. Uh, making it manifest um some sources say that the family thought it could be aunt harriet because she passed away um in, oh, around this time interesting. some sources say the family thought maybe it could be aunt harriet trying to communicate with them so they would even you know be like hey aunt harriet stop doing this or um you know can you give us a sign that it's you and um right. sometimes they would get interactions back like aunt harriet if it's you knock three times they hear three knocks on the wall okay interesting they think it could be aunt harriet um either way the family consulted healthcare professionals as well as their lutheran pastor luther miles shoals um for help luther so, pastor named luther <laughs> i know I was i'm just sorry like, <laughs> and that's the funny thing too with some of these names so what we're going to find out in a bit is that a lot of the sources are from one of the priest's diaries, but they use pseudonyms. So sometimes I'm like, is that for real, this person, or is that like another pseudonym? So that, right. that's like a layer of confusion with the story as well. Yeah. Um, so um, Ronald underwent medical and psychiatric exams, but they didn't find anything abnormal. So. I'm glad he didn't, I hope you didn't have to endure like shock therapy and all that. <laughs> no, I, I don't think he had shocks or anything. Good. Um, but Scholes recommended they contacted um, the Jesuits. So that's just like a religious order of Catholics. I, I don't, that I, that's all I'm going to say about it. Like, I don't really know like uh, what they do, but it sounds like they're really into like the exorcism stuff. <laughs> so yeah. Mom, uh, we're going to need you to send us an email on that. Yeah, mom, tell us tell us more about the just suits. <laughs> um, so they get in contact with Father E. Albert Hughes. Um, and he was granted permission to perform an exorcism in late February 1949, which sounds insanely fast to me personally, because if this activity only started in January, like within a month, a it's approval to do this. Yeah. If, if, and I, I don't know, I don't know a whole lot about exorcisms, but I think it's a pretty, like, intense process. Like, I thought, I thought you had to kind of submit all the stuff and it has to be approved by Vatican City. I could be wrong, but I thought it was kind of a process. It was not something that, boom. But anyway, okay, maybe that's changed. Yeah. Maybe this, so, yeah, okay. So he's, I'm glad that they're finding help soon, well, I guess. Just, just as a fun fact, too, like, I, I looked at a few other stories before I chose this one um apparently like exorcisms are on the rise in the united states that's interesting yeah so <laughs> well, just i don't know one more thing just one just more one thing more. Yeah, yeah okay now we just have yeah. demons running all over the place it's great cool. it's great that's, that's fantastic i feel very lovely. safe lovely <laughs> maybe if you need exorcism you could get someone soon as well so there you yeah. go <laughs> Shit. um God, i'm supposed to sit here and drink my ecto cooler 
So um, Father Hughes uh, tried performing this exorcism at Georgetown University Hospital. And he actually strapped Ronald to his mattress, kind of like in The Exorcist, if you've seen the movie. Yeah. Um, somehow, Ronald got a piece of the mattress spring and sliced Hughes across the shoulder, and that ended the exorcism. Oh, shit. Yeah. So I guess he was just like, all right, well, I'm done. I just got scratched, so we're I just mean, not going to go through this. You know, he's not wrong. <laughs> yes. But not today, Satan. Literally not today. <laughs> Um, (laughs) And then around this time, red scratches start appearing on Ronald, like a few days after this exorcism attempt, and one of which spelled Lewis, L-O-U-I-S, and also, supposedly, one word was also Saturday, scratched into his hip, and three and a half weeks was also scratched on his body, and... (laughs) seems pretty cryptic to me but either the mom or a priest there again two different accounts i've heard it was a priest maybe Hughes, maybe a different priest or the mom but somehow they take this as a message saying that they need to go to st louis on saturday for three and a half weeks <laughs> to get help <laughs> okay well i mean i'm sure they're just reached in at this point uh, yeah and they do have family in st louis so that's convenient that's what they do um, Road trip. So <laughs> it's like our son, we literally are coming because the sign to come here was literally scratched into our, to Ronald's body. Yeah. You think I can, can we stay with you? you think I could be like a refugee in Canada if I start marking up myself, like, hey, it says Halifax. You have to let me in. You have to let me in. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know. I guess it, it, it depends on how this story pans out. I'll get back to you on that. Yeah. Well, let's try. <laughs> Um, (laughs) so there was a cousin attending St. Louis University and this cousin connected the family with Father Walter H. Halloran or the bishop of the university so there again that was like a discrepancy but I'm just going to go with that one because it seemed to be the most popular (laughs) right Um, and in turn he connects them with Reverend William Bowdern so These two visit the relative's home in St. Louis to, you know, check out the kid and see what's going on. Um, And in some cases, they have several assistants with them. And in other cases, it's just the two of them. So who knows? Um, And the priest noticed a pattern. So they noticed during the daytime, everything was just normal and fine. But at night, Ronald would start screaming and have outbursts. He would go into a trance-like state. He would have guttural sounds, like oh, super demonic crap, and his mattress would shake violently. So this um, kid's not getting any sleep. No. <laughs> also, they witnessed objects flying around the room mysteriously, oh. and um, Ronald having adverse reactions to religious relics. So sounds like textbook possession, right? Textbook. So they also noticed an X with scratch on his chest. Um, which they believe signified 10 demons. Okay, I can, I get it. Okay, okay. yeah, makes sense. And then I said, ew, there's also an account of a pitchfork shape of red lines moving from Ronald's thigh down to his ankle, like kind of like under his skin, you know? Oh, Ugh. Ronald, man, damn. And um, things like this occurred every night for a month Jeez. in this account. So they're continuing to do this. And then finally on March 20th. So there again, if this stuff started in January, this is still only March. Like this is amping up really fast. And with well, I had a rough one, sir. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. So um, on March 20th, things kind of amp up where Ronald actually peed all over himself and the bed and shouted and cursed at the priests. Um, his parents moved him to... Alexian Brothers Hospital at this point and took him out of that house. And uh, this is where the exorcisms continued. Some say they continued for like a month at this hospital. So I don't know. There again, the timeline is kind of unclear. But April 18th, supposedly, is the Monday morning after Easter. Um, Ronald stated ha- started having seizures. And he said that Satan, I quote, would always be with him. So the priest just kept doing their exorcism writs at this point. 
And then at 10.45 p.m. that night, the priest called upon St. Michael. Seven minutes later, Ronald was out of his trance and said he's gone. Um, Ronald had a vision of St. Michael vanquishing Satan on a great battlefield, and everything was normal after that. Wow. Yeah. I guess so you would say you got to have faith. <laughs> or St. Michael come and kick some ass for you. <laughs> or Michael. Um, so at this point in history, no one really knew about this case. Like it wasn't really popular. There was only like a vague mention of it in the Washington Post in August 1949. That's going to become important later once okay. we start doing the investigation. Um, and William Peter Blatty brought awareness to this case in 1971 when he released his best-selling novel, The Exorcist, uh, based on the unofficial diaries of Halloran and Bowdern, those two okay. priests that were doing the exorcisms. Gotcha. So that's kind of what so that's how it gets back in the scene, I guess. Yeah. So it's not until several years later that this actually becomes like popular. Makes sense. So that took me down a rabbit hole because remember how I said the timeline was bothering me, the inconsistencies in which priests were present when, like, it right. was really just bugging me. So then I started doing my own little investigation on like, all right, what is the true story? Which took me to a journalist who already did that. So Mark Obsasnik, I hope I'm saying his name right. It's O-P-S-A-S-N-I-C-K. I think it's Obsasnik. Yeah, I would guess that. Um, he Marco. Is, huh? Marco. Marco. Yeah, I'm just calling <laughs> that. Um, <laughs> so he's an investigative journalist, and in 1999, I believe he pub he got down to the bottom of this and published like a 26 page article in Strange Magazine. Um, which to me sounds like the true story. So I'm going to kind of go over what he uncovered. Gotcha. And he is the guy who actually did such a good paper trail of going through actual news clippings, looking at dates. He was able to figure out what city this actually happened in and who the person was. Gotcha. So very good so, investigator. Not to jump ahead, so because we're probably going to get there. So just tell me, will we find out what happens to Ronald? Like, after all of this and he goes up and he's like, well, well yeah he's dead there. now he died in 2020 right that's what i say like we find out like does he just look like a normal life after this it seems like it but you might have a different opinion of ronald throughout okay. this investigation okay. i'll wait though so, i'll wait on um, so obsessnik i'm just gonna call him mark <laughs> Um, he confirmed the boy's date of birth was given in an article as June 1st, 1935. And then from that date, he was able to estimate Ronald's graduation year, which would have likely been around 1954. Okay. And then after obtaining a copy of the 1954 um, Gonzaga High School yearbook, he checked for any uh, graduates who were both members of St. James Church in Mount Rainer, that's what people originally thought the town was, but it's not. That's where he realized it was Cottage City. And they're gonna, I'm not going into all the details, but he just did great detective work essentially. Yeah. By interviewing some of the priests who were present, also just looking through old news clippings, he was able to do all of this. Um, I feel like uh, Marco here is like a natural JB Fletcher. Yeah, yeah, for real. <laughs> like, I'm impressed. <laughs> Way to so, go. Yeah, so once he started, like, kind of honing in on this, he was able to narrow it down to five potential students who were the kid that was possessed. And then he went from there, like, interviewing people in the town and, and doing oh, his detective work yeah. and figured out who it was. So I'm going to kind of briefly go over some of the articles that he referenced to kind of help with the timeline and also the inconsistencies. So... I kind of blame the media for making this such a tangled mess between unnamed sources in some of these or using pseudonyms and like the whole timeline inconsistencies. So right. we'll start with August 10th, 1949. The Washington Post article called Pastor Tells Eerie Tell of Haunted Boy uh, was published. So an unnamed pastor in this article who I later found out, I thought at first it was probably Luther Miles Scholes, and it's confirmed later from a parapsychology bulletin that, yes, this is that pastor. 
Okay. But at the time of publishing, he was unnamed. So he gave a speech at a meeting of the Society of Parapsychology, nice. which already sounds awesome. I would love yeah, to do a meeting like that. I, I want to put that on, on my calendar. I want you to see, like, okay, so it's in the clock on Tuesday. I have an appointment. <laughs> <laughs> Paranormal psychology uh, speech. <laughs> yeah. A luncheon, if you will. <laughs> Yeah, so at this meeting, um, beginning January 18th, so there again, that January 1949 timeline seems to resonate and kind of fit. He says that beginning January 18th, 1949, the family began experiencing scratching sounds from the walls and Ronald's bed shaking violently and objects levitating when Ronald was present. So that kind of sounds like the summary of the story. Um, right. Right. And the minister, being skeptical, had Ronald sleep over at his house on February 17th, which I think sounds kind of creepy, but okay. All right, Um, yeah. So Ronald was sleeping nearby uh, the minister, and uh, surely enough, at the minister's house, he heard scratching on the walls and the bed vibrating. Um, Even a heavy armchair that Ronald was sitting in tilted on its own, and blankets that Ronald was sleeping on moved around the room on their own. So pretty weird. So he's the he's the one that brings it that it's attracted to. Yeah, no it seems like it. it. Yep. It's not the house, it's definitely him. <laughs> right. And that that's interesting too, because at one like you're already hearing them say like a haunted boy. And it sounds more like a haunting kind of case in these early articles. And then it evolves into like a possession. <laughs> so right. um there again, so also on August 10th, the Evening Star, just later that evening after this Washington Post article was released, they released their own story, and it's called Minister Tells Parapsychologist Noisy Ghost Plague Family. Um, so in this article, it's kind of a similar account, but there's a little bit more details. So in this account, the, the boy's name is the pseudonym Roland, and he is 13 years old. Um, Roland made, it says that Roland made two trips to a psych clinic and that Roland had three different exorcism writs performed by three different sects, including Episcopal, Lutheran, and Roman Catholic. Okay. Um, so quoted Richard C. Darnell, who's the president of the society as saying that Dr. J.B. Ryan, director of the parapsychology laboratory at Duke University, called the so-called haunting the impressive manifestation sorry the most imp- I, I saw something weird happen what happened oh I that was know. weird <laughs> i hope i'm not like conjuring yeah, something yeah we're conjuring something because <laughs> like our the we record on zoom and we didn't get the countdown it just shut off and then adele's computer it just like it just screen just went <laughs> yeah that was creepy um very creepy well Anyway, okay, so uh, this director said uh, the so-called haunting uh, was the most impressive manifestation he has heard of in the poltergeist field. Wow. He seems like he's a believer. Right. And then the next day, August 11th, um, the Times Herald posted um, haunted boy's parents tell a ghost message. Wait, tell of ghost messages. Sorry. (laughs) I can't read. Um, So... This is where they're talking about, they call it dermographic messages. So like those rashes and scratches okay, that are that like makes sense. The derma, yeah. So dermographic messages and a rash on the boy's body. Um, the family minister, so probably Scholes, um, thought it was just a normal rash though. <laughs> this account. It's Lewis. <laughs> I mean, that's a normal <laughs> rash. Okay. <laughs> okay. And, uh, all right. <laughs> and in this article, the boy goes to St. Louis and was normal after having a vision of saint michael chasing away satan so this one kind of plants that seed out there too with what we hear from the general story right so then august 19th the evening star publishes a priest freed boy of possession by devil church sources say so in this article a catholic priest has successfully freed a 14 year old mount rainer Maryland boy so that's where you get that town of reported possession by the devil here um early this year it was disclosed today um an exorcism was given after Georgetown University Hospital and St. Louis University studied the boy 
so this is kind of reiterating that he did go to try to get like mental health right so all of this seems like it's checking out yeah it kind of does right so then august 20th the evening star uh publishes new detail of boys exorcism and catholic ritual disclosed um so church sources said during the writ ronald recited blasphemous curses um intermingled with latin oh so, there you go that's like the exorcist right and then August 20th, the Washington Post published Priest Freeze Mount Rainer Boy reported held in devil's grip. <laughs> oh, that's, um, that's a pretty dramatic headline. Yeah. <laughs> <Dang>. <laughs> that would catch my attention. I mean, yeah. <laughs> read it, um, read it. <laughs> so this article goes into details of the strange activity the family experienced. And it says that Ronald had 20 to 30 exorcisms performed to cast out the devil um says it really intense right exorcism that oh god uh yeah it sounds abusive (laughs) Um, (laughs) and this in this article it says a priest um in his 50s had accompanied the boy for two months so i think that's where kind of that timeline of these exorcisms going on for like a few months kind of ties in yeah, I think for me, and, and again, it's like this is the first time I'm really hearing these accounts, but just like thinking about the timeline in my head, I'm just thinking like, I guess for me where it breaks down, it's like he gets this vision of St. Michael and it sounds like he's just completely cured, but it almost seems like he's had like, but you like he had 20 to 30 exorcisms between that time or after that, like yeah. it just doesn't, like that part seems like it doesn't add up a right? little, a gray area for me. Because it almost sounds like to me initially, like after the St. Michael comes in, defeats all the devil, that he's we're good to go. And one thing that bothers me is that these articles, even though these are news sources, still feels too much like tabloids to me. I, yeah, especially. Yeah, I can I can see that, especially with unnamed sources and pseudonyms like that's really troublesome to me. But hold up. Because it's my birthday, and the best birthday gift I ever got was last year. <laughs> Whenever our friend Charles, you know him as Mr. Sheffield from The Nanny, but I know him as Dimitri the Vampire from Mom's Got a Date the Vampire. And you remember how the little boy like pulls out that copy of the tabloid about Van Helsing, and it was real. Oh, that's true. So, I mean, sometimes what you read in the tabloids maybe can't be true. All right, all right, I'll give you I wanted that. to bring that full circle. <laughs> I was really like, where are you going with this? <laughs> that was birthday, best birthday present ever, tabloid. But you just said tabloid, and pretty much, if you want to know where my head was, I just immediately Dimitri. thought of that scene of being like, well, actually, it is real. I read it in the Inquirer. <laughs> if you don't know what I'm talking about, it's the scene from Mom's Got a Date with a Vampire, the best Disney original, period. <laughs> sorry continue <laughs> all right <laughs> so these may be true tabloid stories but um hang on do you remember whenever he made that message for me charles did and then he could tell he did the math <laughs> he's <was> like, <laughs> he like you're like a real like you weren't a child when this movie came out <laughs> like <laughs> you can see it on his face you can see it on his face like you know, he does like he's just like so excited and like you could just tell the math clicked and he was kind of like he's like you're turning 39 <laughs> wait a minute <laughs> that yeah it was great it was kind of I think he felt real uncomfortable at that point it's like we got to bring this to an end <laughs> he's like <laughs> then he says good for you kind of like oh yay <laughs> <laughs> okay sorry we'll yeah. repost it so you can yeah. get in on this inside joke as well <laughs> absolutely sorry I'm um, so sorry I always fun. turn something like an exorcism into you know a laughing matter I apologize yeah well, I don't know. Some of this is a little bit hilarious. Um, <laughs> so um, where was I? Okay. And this also, prov- this article also provided details that the exorcisms were started in St. Louis, continued in DC, and then completed in St. Louis. 
So that too. I'm like, why are they moving this possessed kid around so much? Like just leave him in one place. I feel like he already has enough going on. Yeah. Without that. And um, this article also says during the Ritz, the boy had tantrums, screamed, cursed, and spoke in Latin. Um, He had the vision of St. Michael. And this was the article that actually piqued uh, William Peter uh, Batty's. Is that right? Anyway, the author of The Exorcist, like this, this is the article that really got him interested in writing that book. Right. Like this topic. So in January 1975, I know we're jumping way ahead, uh, Fate magazine published The Truth Behind the Exorcist um, by Steve Erdman. So this is after the Exorcist movie has already come out. So they're just trying to, I guess, give you a little bit of backstory on inspiration. Um, So this story confirms it's a 14-year-old boy named Roland Doe. That's pseudonym um they also gave they also gave aunt harriet a pseudonym of aunt tilly (laughs) um and this this gets into her you know teaching him about the ouija board in january of 1949 um and that he was treated at georgetown university hospital and exercised at st louis university um and that there was a diary kept by one of the priests. So this is where that kind of gets into the mix. And it also summarized that in fall of 1949, a Georgetown University student whose psychiatrist father may have been involved in the case told a faculty member, I know it's like telephone, told a faculty member, Father Eugene B. Gallagher of this diary. So we don't know who this college student is, but anyway, they, they tell this priest that, hey, my dad may have worked on the case of this exorcism and there is this diary. So Eugene acquired 16 pages supposedly in one account it's 26. So we don't actually know. He pages. He acquired some pages of this diary like document from I'm the sorry, psychiatrist. Who is Eugene again? He's the writer of the exorcist or um, he's just a faculty member at Georgetown okay. University. Got it, got it, got it. But he's also, you know, a Catholic priest. Okay. And um, he's interested in getting that diary as kind of a guide for exorcisms. Okay. Yeah, and he was now. able to get at least some of the pages from this psychiatrist, supposedly. And then um, this document, this diary-like document, it it does kind of confirm a lot of these things. Um but it's kind of hard to tell if they've experienced these things firsthand or if it's just hearsay that they're documenting like what other people have told them. Right. But this document does have this flow of events. So January 15th, 1949, there again, seems like the right timeline, reports drip dripping noises. So like those leaky pipes and things. Right. Um, that a picture of Christ was shaking on the wall. Mm. Um, scratching noises under the floorboards um, heard every night onward between 7 p.m. and midnight for 10 days but not 3 a.m. not 3 a.m. no Um, and I think this is really creepy too this also says that the boy heard squeaking shoes on his bed for six nights like I I don't like that and then it goes on to January 26, 1949. Aunt Tilly dies of MS at age 54. Oh, that's sad. Yeah. So Ronald's mom thought maybe the occurrences were her sister trying to communicate. Makes sense. So she tried communicating back. She would say, this was like, hey, knock three times. It would knock three times. Hey, knock four times. It would knock four times. And then they also started hearing scratching from Ronald's bed, which I'm like, that doesn't sound like a friendly aunt Tilly or, you know, whatever. And then February 17th, 1949, uh, Scholes, you remember the Lutheran, Luther Scholes? um, (laughs) Dr. Scholes. This is where he had the boys spend the night and confirmed the things that he had already mentioned with like the chair and the blankets and then February 26, 1949, um, Mark started appearing on the boy's body in this document. So 
now we're going back to the article that I was talking about that was released in 1975, the Fate Magazine article. Um, And then this goes on to say, uh, March 9th, Raymond J. Bishop. Now, this was a name that bothered me because I heard it in one story and only one story and not in any of the other stories. So I was like, who is this guy and was he actually a part of this or not? So this article says on March 9th, Raymond J. Bishop of St. Louis University was called and witnessed the scratches. So this is like the first time I've heard that he was confirmed being involved in this at all. Um, so you probably have no idea what I'm talking about because I didn't mention him in the story because I only saw him referenced like somewhere else, but it just bothered me that there was this mention right. of this guy and I couldn't find him mentioned in any of the other accounts of the same I, story. I hate to say this and I know you're going to get there and tie it up in a really nice neat bow for us, but at this point, like, do we think there's child abuse? Maybe. Okay. Um, I hate to say that, but I'm just kind of thinking, uh, um, was Aunt Harriet a safe space? Well, I don't know. We'll see. We'll talk about that. That can be a point of discussion. Um, So that was March 9th. Raymond J. Bishop is called in and witnessed the scratches. March 11th, Father Bowdern is brought in. So he's the one that actually conducted the exorcism, if you recall. And March 16th, Archbishop Joseph E. Ritter granted Bowder permission for the exorcism. So this goes on throughout March and April between an aunt's home in St. Louis, I think, and Alexi and Brothers Hospital, which those locations and timeline do kind of confirm in the story, like when the exorcism finally started working. Right. <laughs> and essentially, like, finally Satan was cast out of this kid. Okay, so now we're going to get into the investigation part from Mark. And this is kind of where we can talk about our theories. Um, So Mark says, so he contacts, like I said, he does his really good detective work. So not only does he uncover that it's Ronald, that is like the possessed boy, but he also just goes to this town and starts interviewing people. And he interviews one of Ronald's best friends that who he didn't name. They're under the pseudonym BC. Um, anyway, um, he says, I can say that BC, Ronald's best friend, provided a detailed profile of an only child who went through anything but a normal childhood. There, okay. Um, smothered right. by his obsessively religious mother and grandmother who held deep interest in spiritualism and Ouija boards, shunned by his classmates at school, prone to tantrums and even violent outbursts towards his family and his few friends, exhibiting cruel, at times even sadistic behavior towards other children and even animals. Oh, no. It was evident that elements of the alleged possession had always been there going back years and years. Okay. Now it's starting to make more sense, huh? And um, goes on to say, one thing happened regarding all of this, and I have a hard time clearing it in my mind. We were in eighth grade. It was the 40, sorry, it was 48, 49 school year. And we were all in a class together at Bladensburg Junior High. He was sitting in a chair and it was one of those deals with one arm attached you know, those school chairs. Oh, Uh, yeah. And it looked like he was shaking the desk. The desk was shaking and vibrating extremely fast. And I remember the teacher yelling at him to stop it. And I remember he kind of yelled, I'm not doing it. And they Mm -hmm. took him out of the class. And that was the last I ever saw of him in school. So that sounds kind of weird. Like, okay, did he have weird possession shit going on? Or was he just trying to get attention? And this same person, I'm going to paraphrase the story. Also, apparently, like, Ronald was kind of a little asshole. So this same person says that Ronald kind of took in this really mean neighborhood dog. And for some reason, he was the only person, like, this dog likes. And uh, he would secretly, like, feed it. And, like, his parents didn't know he had it. But he would stick that dog on all of his friends. So he called this kid, this BC kid, He's like, hey, come over. 
I got something oh. fun to show you. When the kid gets there, the kid's like, what the hell's going on? He hears like the back door slam and that dog just started chasing him. And then he like ran away from the dog. And then Ronald called him on the phone, like after the kid got home and he was laughing his ass off at how funny it was that that dog was trying to attack him. So why did, said, why did he see want to be best friends with someone like that? Right. Uh, but he said that he did this to other people too. So I don't know if I feel so bad for Ronald now. Um, that that's kind of some of the details that came out of this. I can definitely tell that this investigator thinks that this is all fake. Um, yeah. so now, we can, now we can kind of start picking this apart. So like I, I listed some critiques, like I said, the timeline is a big problem for me. Um, also like there's some accounts of like, what his mom says happened versus what was in the diary of that priest, like still just big problems with order of events right? are not reconciled for me. Um, there's also no written record of that exorcism attempt by father John Hughes, the one that supposedly got slashed in the arm. Hmm. Um, actually this investigator, Mark, um, even like tracked down uh, congregation members because I think in one story, Hughes is like really troubled by what happened and didn't like, you know, host church or preach during a time period. But all the congress, like all the congregation say, no, he didn't miss any church. He was fine and normal and he didn't have an arm injury. So that's a problem. And it looks like Bowdern um, had no idea that this first exorcism was attempted but you surely they would have told him if they had to go through that approval process. Here's my issue, if I may. I feel like exorcisms have to be seriously like they take they take that stuff very serious. Yeah. And I feel like the approval timeline doesn't make sense to me because I really do think you have to have approval from Vatican City. Like, I think it is a process. And not only that, and don't put me on that, but not only that, I think it has to be like documented and I don't know that you can even do these things alone like I think there has to be other witness like valid witnesses present and those are the things that don't make sense to me like I just don't see how you would get approval for an exorcism that fast um and the documentation just doesn't seem to be there for me those are the those are just my initial thoughts yeah I think on Inside Edition, too, this was kind of a smoking gun for me. I think that was the source. Sorry if I'm wrong. It was one of the sources I named. But according to his long-term companion, I quote, he said he wasn't possessed. It was all concocted. He said, I was just a bad boy. So that's what his his partner said. It's kind of like, you know, the story we covered last week. uh, Whenever the family um, for the house, like, made up all this stuff for money, you know? So, I thought that could be... I mean, maybe he was just a bad kid, and mom had to play it off, like, he's possessed. Yeah, and her being so highly religious and just... She may have thought he truly was. Maybe she did. Um, This is also really cool. So, this investigator, Mark... uh, uh, obsessnik um he actually spoke with holloran one of the priests that supposedly did the exorcism that, interesting you know. so he said i first asked if he would go on record as saying whether he thought the boy was possessed or not quote no i can't go on record he told me i never made an absolute statement about the things because i didn't feel i was qualified i hadn't studied the phenomena and that sort of thing um all i did was report the things that i saw and whether i would make a statement one way or another wouldn't make any difference because i just don't think i was qualified to do so so he would not go on record even saying that he thought the boy was possessed the and um more behavioral issues so this is kind of like mark's summary i think he says um he questioned many of the supernatural claims associated with the story proposing that Ronald Doe, or or sorry, Roland Doe, you know, the pseudonym, was simply a spoiled, disturbed bully who threw deliberate tantrums to get attention to get out of school. Obsasnik reports that 
Halloran, who was present, um, never heard the boy's voice change. And he thought the boy merely mimicked Latin. So kind of like what they were saying, he was mimicking it back, not actually right. speaking Latin. And um, rather than getting a sudden ability to speak Latin. Yeah. So he's like, I don't think he was actually speaking it. He was more yeah. just like mimicking what we were saying. And I feel like a real qualified priest that does exorcisms is probably an expert in Latin. Yeah, yeah. Because, like, that's just not tying in. Like, no, I think you just got a, a, a brat on your hands. Yeah. I think, you have, I think you have a problem, child. You have a I, junior. <laughs> yeah, it's a junior. Um, <laughs> but then I, I finished it up with some creepy facts. Um, so the room, supposedly an Alexandrian, or sorry, Alexian, brother's hospital was sealed after this supposed exorcism and now the facility is gone it was torn down in 1978 so that seemed kind of odd but the building's not there now so i don't know i mean it could have just been that an asylum closed down or maybe it had asbestos or something yeah um also or maybe I, this I, kid burned it down <laughs> right <laughs> I had never heard this before, but supposedly the film, The Exorcist is Cursed, kind of like um, Poltergeist. Poltergeist, yeah. yeah I so think maybe... I did know that. Didn't they have like deaths and stuff like in real life on The Exorcist, like in Poltergeist or something? I don't remember. I don't know. I mean, that could be like a good topic for another day, but yeah. I had never heard that it was supposedly like cursed, but still interesting. Um, yeah. So... <laughs> Just because I was really bothered by the timeline, I pretty mm-hmm. much did my own investigation of this guy's investigation that he already did. And I think this kid was full of shit. Yeah. And I thought that's, um, that's a pretty serious fire to be playing with. Yeah. You know, because I do believe that people can get possessed. And I do believe that if you invite that sort of energy in, that's kind of playing with fire. Uh I just, I just thought he was a brat. I thought he was just yeah, a asshole. I think and was I feel like maybe, like maybe his parents were trying to get him like psychiatric help and he turned it into, oh no, I'm not in that hospital. I'm basically being possessed. You know what I mean? Like trying yeah. to act like, you know, and they might just like trying to send him to like a boarding school situation. <laughs> like, just please, I can't deal with him. And yeah. kind of make it sound all like I'm possessed by the Jeff. It's all very odd, too, because it's like if he was doing this for attention because he was a brat, it's funny how much he worried about his privacy. Yeah. Like not wanting to be named because even um, Mark um, Upsasnik, he called Roland. He's like, I know it was you. Um, Do you want to tell me like the story? And he wasn't very cooperable. And he was just like, yeah, never call me again. (laughs) (laughs) So we really don't know what happened to Roland. Well, we know the NASA part, which is surprising to me that he would. I figured See, a kid like this would end up in so jail. Cool. Well, now I'm just like, Ew, of course she would work for her NASA or the government. Yeah. <laughs> so, I'm like, oh, I'm just thinking this poor sweet child, you know, just. Mm. Yeah, I, that's what I think he was just a little asshole. I mean, it's a lot to unpack. Like it's a lot. I really was trying to pick such a simple possession story. <laughs> um, some of the other ones I tried, there just wasn't enough information. And I was like, well, right. this was huge. So there's going to be tons of information. But then it bothered me how much they didn't line up. Yeah. And apparently it I bothered mean, a lot of people enough to do an true, investigation. You're uh, a true, Adele, you're a true investigator. Very proud of you. That was <laughs> way to go. <laughs> yeah. I don't know why my, I just, I just can't leave well enough alone. You just so can't leave well enough My alone. episodes always turn into this. <laughs> and that's what Roland was saying too. He was like, just leave it alone, man. I was possessed. Okay. Yeah. So <laughs> yeah, I think he was just a little shit. <laughs> I mean, yeah. I, it's kind of a bummer. Yeah. Kind of a bummer, but it's like, I think it's really unfortunate. Um, I think it speaks a lot for like where he was mentally to go. I mean, can you imagine like, doing the things he did just to get attention like he definitely had a cry for help for sure it's weird Maybe too, like, just a jerk. the last thing i would want though is to be in a freaking hospital with people trying to exercise me like well he didn't want to go months. to school he did not want to go to school i really hated school but i <laughs> never thought to go to- <laughs> 
to go that far. I don't know. I hated church more than school. So, you know, <laughs> well, I maybe Robin was just like, maybe in his mind, he just wanted some peace and quiet and no homework. And he's like, I'll just have to, I'm going to have to basically stab you know, these words in my on me and do all this crazy stuff to get that break. I mean, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's just- I mean, that's kind of the lingering stuff too, though. I think. I wish we knew more about that diary and like whose it was and was yeah. it their firsthand account or was it just them documenting what people were already telling them right. happened before they got there. So true. Hmm. Because I don't know. It's, it's like, just the way it appeared seems like a little sketch to me too. Yeah. You know what I mean? I, and just, I don't know. That best friend kind of giving the storyline like this kid always acted like crap like, like this isn't new this kid's a fucking asshole he just he amped it up <laughs> <laughs> i've got your case solved right here but you know that wouldn't make headlines too so then i think you get into maybe there were things that didn't line up that you know headlines pay and sell papers so yeah i mean i i really too. was trying i was like maybe uh, like throughout my research i was like maybe it's possession like there were sometimes it's like i don't know that doesn't sound right but I mean, Sorry. maybe he just needed a timeout or what? He got one. He got one. <laughs> Careful what you wish for. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe he needed to spend some time with our mom. <laughs> <laughs> she would have been like, oh, hell no. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my gosh. Oh, oh, that was a great story. What a bummer. Uh, but, you know, like it, people go through great lengths to get some attention so uh, you know like we said we're trying to bring you a balanced view so I had to do it I had to go there yeah I mean it's a part of the job man it it is it is it's a part of the job I don't like shall we spin the will to see let's sorry the wheel to see what we're going to be talking about next week what are we going to be talking about next week all right you see the wheel all right spin it spin that wheel and that will <gasps> curses curses all right that's gonna be a fun oh. one well, i'm basically gonna cover the supreme court no, <laughs> <laughs> maybe try to find some sort of magic that we could use <laughs> i know i was like you know maybe i can maybe this could be um an applicable uh story maybe i can yeah. find some um Find some hoodoo voodoo. <laughs> uh, now, this will be great. Conspiracies on here. Maybe I should put that in there because conspiracy I'm thinking is if the Antichrist is real, these people are sure as hell trying to make sure it's born. <laughs> <laughs> you know, this is true. This is true. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that so curses next week. So I'm, I'm looking forward to covering that. Yeah, that'll be fun. Topic. Well, Del, thank you for that. That was a great story. Yeah, it was it was not easy to uh, <laughs> to uh, cover, but but you know what's sad is now all I'm gonna think of when I like see the exorcist is Roland Doe. <laughs> that's always that stupid student is gonna be what Roland I Doe, what yeah. I associate with the exorcist now. What I'm gonna be like, okay, yeah. <laughs> and a bad and, a, and a, a bad kid yeah i'm just gonna picture junior like levitating in a bed <laughs> yeah it's like and we're gonna be laughing the whole time people aren't, aren't you terrified of the exorcists nope <laughs> nope and you shouldn't be either because it's very this unlikely it was true wow just what this is this is next level <laughs> yeah <laughs> oh well thank you adele that was great and we thank you guys so much for listening and we hope that you all stay safe take care of your um take care of your mental self as all of this stuff unfolds and we always say here stay curious and stay safe yeah yes please stay safe and just stay grounded try to find peace where you maybe can. smoke some weed if you maybe smoke some weed or just <laughs> I mean, well, you can't even do that legally in most places either. So, That's true. And, I'm sure, and I'm sure, but I'm sure the government's going to ban. Uh, they're going to not. They're going to take that away from the state. <laughs> they're going to let you the state to choose abortion, but they're going to want to take control of that. Yeah. <laughs> so maybe we should basically just be 
preparing for an apocalypse. I don't know, but just be safe. <laughs> yeah. Um, are you still there? Oh, there you are. It switched screens on me again. That's crazy. Okay. We, weird stuff is happening here, guys. We're going to go this? Sage. I know your screen looks crazy. What All is right, it we're doing? Gonna, we're going to go Sage, friends. All right, yeah. Maybe the exorcist is real. <laughs> <laughs> bye, you guys. All right, bye, guys. <laughs>